It's great to see you guys. Great to be back here with you. I have been looking forward to this weekend for quite some time for a few reasons. One, I get to get to be back here with you all, which I consider you all a second family to me. So great to see you. Um, I also been looking forward to this weekend because two days ago, my wife and I celebrated 27 years of marriage. Yes. I know what you're thinking. I got married when I was five. I know that's what you're thinking, right? Um, So big for us as a family, but also I've been looking forward to this uh, weekend because we get to continue in this series called Asking for a Friend. For for those of you who are new and this is your first time with us, thanks for trusting us with your morning. We get you to be anywhere right now, so thanks for being here with us. Uh, What we've been doing in this series is, is we've been looking to the Bible to look for answers to tough questions. And Pastor Daniel and Ryan, I've been tuning in every week. They've been doing an incredible job. If you've missed any of those messages, make sure to go online and check them out. Today, we're going to ask a question, and it's a big one, and I think it's a pretty relevant one. And the question is this. We're going to get right to it. The question is, does the Bible have anything to say about depression? Now, uh, to me, I don't know if there's a more pressing issue that most people are dealing with in the world because this is a specific question that really points to a bigger and broader issue, which is the emotional and mental well-being and health of all of us which according to statistics and surveys, and there are a ton of them out there, but it doesn't matter which one you look at, it doesn't paint a pretty picture for most people in the world. I, I found some, some statistics and some studies that really just blew me away. One, of, one, one is this stat right here, one out of two people. Uh, this was a study done by Harvard. One out of every two people in the world will develop in their lifetime at some point a mental health disorder. That's shocking. Right now, uh, as of 2023, I think it's 280, 5% of the world's population, the adults, they struggle with some form of depression. In the United States, 29% of all U.S. adults have been diagnosed with depression. These are just people who've raised their hand and who've gotten help. These, are, these numbers are staggering. And, and, I, and I know we know this, but I think it's important for us to remember that these numbers are Aren't just, st- aren't just numbers, they're not just statistics. These numbers are people, like real people who are really struggling with real things. They are hopeless, they are desperate, they have, they're at the end of their rope. Some people are, are considering ending their lives. The statistics on suicide are mind-blowing. So I don't know if there's a more important topic for us to dig into. Now, again, I know that we know this, but these these stats and these people and these numbers, they're not just out there. They're not just outside of these walls. No, they're in these walls. It's not a them thing. It's an us thing. Because depression, it does not discriminate. It goes after anyone and everyone, and it comes at us in different ways. There's different kinds of depression. For some of you, you may be struggling with uh, biological or physiological issues that are causing your depression. So for you, maybe there's a chemical imbalance in your your brain, like I have. I've struggled with that my whole life. There may be others of you who um, it's hormonal. You're going through some hormonal changes or your, your balances are off, and it's throwing you completely sideways. For others of you, it may be nutrition. You may be nutrient deficient in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you're not getting, simple as it may sound, maybe you're not getting enough sunlight. 
It may be that you're dealing with chronic pain. I don't know what those things are, but I want you to know that I get it. I've struggled with this kind of depression my whole life. And what's so crazy about this kind of depression is that everything in your life can be great. Everything in your life can be good except for you. And I want you to know if you struggle with that kind of depression, that you are not alone. You, there's nothing for you to be ashamed of. It's not a sin and you're not crazy. It's just simply there's some things going on with you that are off balance but they need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed by a professional, which I am not. I'm not a physician, I'm a pastor, but praise the Lord that we do have doctors and physicians and therapists who can help us with these complex types of issues. So there may be some of you who are struggling with biological type, physiological type symptoms for depression, but there may be others of you here today, and your depression is more connected to a season or a circumstance. Like for you, maybe it's relational right now. Like your marriage is an absolute mess. Maybe your marriage just ended and you're going through a really tough divorce. Or maybe you have kids that are running as far away from you as fast as they can and they're throwing their lives away and you can't do anything about it. Maybe at work, your coworkers or your boss, I think the biblical term for them is jerk faces, right? Like they're just, they're just really not nice people and it is just wearing you out. Maybe recently you lost a loved one and you're grieving or you've gone through some serious trauma and you're trying to put the pieces back together. Maybe you're struggling financially. I don't know. And for some of you, you're like, check, 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 check. It's not one of those things. It's all of those things. Have you ever been in that season of life where you feel like you're just in the ocean and every single time you're about to get your your feet back under, you get hit by another wave? And as soon as you get back up, you get hit by another wave. I don't know what you're struggling with, but I want you to know a couple of things as we dive into God's word this morning. One, I want you to know that this is a safe place for you. This is a safe place for you to raise your hand and say, it's okay for you to not be okay here. I also want you to know that you are, that you're not alone. That we as a people, we have you. And I want you to know that the Lord has you as well. When we look to scripture, what we see is that these these struggles are not new struggles. These are not new issues. Emotional, mental, depression, it's all throughout scripture. You read through the Bible and you see person after person, heroes of the faith, struggling with these types of issues. Moses, David, King Solomon, Job, Jonah, Jeremiah, Jesus, they all struggled, had faced these types of struggles. So the question this morning isn't, Is there something the Bible says about depression? The question is like, where do we spend our time? Because there's so much for us to dig into. And so what I want us to do is I want us to spend some time in an Old Testament book this morning called 1 Kings. And I want us to look at my favorite prophet, a man named Elijah. And if you jump, when you jump into 1 Kings 16, what you see is that there was a king at this time and his name was, anybody know? His name was? Ahab. And Ahab was a bad man. Scripture tells us that in the eyes of the Lord, he had done more evil than any king before him, which is like not a title you want to put on your resume. So this is a bad dude. To make matters worse, though, he was married to a bad woman. Anybody know her name? Her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel had a hobby. She had a side hustle which was uh, in her free time, she would go and kill God's prophets, right? And so the two of them, like, match made, I was going to say match made in heaven, match made in hell, right? Like, they're two peas in a pod. And so they are, they're kind of running the show at this time. And as you can imagine, God's people, they're suffering under this. They have, they've kind of, they're all over the place. And they have began to turn away from the Lord and turn to idols, And so God sends Elijah to them, not just to condemn them, but to call them back to him. And so he sends Elijah, and when Elijah gets there in front of these people, he does not mince words. In verse 18, it says this, Elijah says, you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals, these idols. In verse 21, he says, how long are you going to waver between these two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So God sends Elijah to basically send this message, enough is enough. 
this straddling the fence and you're going to worship this God and this God and this God, it's got to stop and it needs to be settled. And so this is how we're going to settle it. Elijah says, get everybody. Get the prophets, get all the people, and let's go up on Mount Carmel and this settle this thing with a good old-fashioned throwdown. And here's the details of the throwdown. This is how we're going to settle it. Each of us, we're going to get a bull, and we're going to sacrifice this bull, and then we're going to call on our God. And whichever God responds, that's the true God. We good? Everybody in? All right, let's go. So Elijah, being the gentleman that he is, he lets the prophets of Baal and Asherah go, and they, in the morning, they get after it, boy. They get this bull, they put it on wood, and they start calling on their God. Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. They go on all morning. Guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing. And I love this part because around lunchtime, it says this in verse 27. This is my favorite part of the story. It says this, at noon, Elijah began to what? Taunt them. He says, shout louder. He said, surely he is God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So in the midst of this epic throwdown, Elijah is talking trash. Like this may be the first ever historic recorded, you know, example of talking trash, and it's found in the Old Testament of the Bible. So Elijah starts talking trash at noon, which sends these prophets into a frenzy. Because they're like, oh, no, 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 he ain't going to talk trash to us. So they, it says they went after even harder. And so they go from morning to noon, well into the evening, and what happens? Nothing. Nothing. Absolute crickets. No response. So no response from their God. So now it's Elijah's turn. So he takes the bull. He places it on his altar. And before he calls on the Lord, he says, let's take this up a notch. Let's do this. Hey, you guys see those jars over there? Fill those four jars of water up and then pour it on top of the bull. And don't just do it one time. Do it three times just to make it fun, right? So at this time, everything's soaked. And now here comes the moment. And Elijah, he steps up and he reaches his hands to the heavens and he calls on the Lord. He says this in verse 36, answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know what? That you are God and that you are turning their hearts back to them. In this moment, Elijah cries out and guess what happens? The Lord responds. Verse 38, then fire, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice the wood and the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. So God responds, and when the people saw this, they fell to the ground, and they began to declare, the Lord, he is God. 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 Do you hear what I'm saying? The Lord, he is God. Elijah steps up in this moment, calls on the Lord, God answers. These people turn, but the story doesn't end there. No, it says at the end of chapter 18 that Elijah had all those prophets of Baal slaughtered. I mean, you want to talk about like an epic throwdown, like a mountaintop moment. That's where Elijah was. I mean, it couldn't get any more intense. It couldn't get any more higher than that. He's at the highest of highs. But look what happens next in chapter 19. It says this in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. So right after God delivers Elijah, Jezebel finds out and she's not happy. And she basically just puts a bounty on him and says, hey, man, you're a dead man, dude, which no one ever wants to receive. That's not something anyone's like, hey, got a text message this morning. Someone wants to kill me. Like, no one is happy about that, right? <laughs> but at the same time, like, what's Elijah going to do to that? He's like, you would think he'd be like, whatever. Like, I can imagine him pulling out his phone and then texting her back like, I hope you do come after me. You're walking over, 
but at a minimum, you are going to limp backwards. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, did you not hear what just happened? My God just delivered me. Bring it on, woman. That's how he responds, right? Not so much. It says this in verse 3, Elijah was what? Afraid. And ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he, was, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. What? He's filled with what? And he does what? And he says what? Yeah. In a matter of days, Elijah goes from mountaintop to meltdown. He gets this message from Jezebel, and he doesn't put her in her place and say, bring it on. No, this man, run, he's filled with fear, runs for his life. He's completely exhausted to the point where he is suicidal, ready to take his life. Anybody know what it's like to be there? Anyone been there? I have. And what's so crazy and what's so ironic about my Elijah moment when I'm sitting under this bush suicidal, it came in a season when I was the lead pastor of my church the lead pastor of my home church. I had started, my family started attending this church when I was 12. When I was 12, I was a rebellious, uh, hard-headed, not wanting to go to church kind of kid. Like I used to make myself sick so I didn't have to go. And then the Lord in his sense of humor says, guess what's gonna happen with you 20 years from now, son? You're gonna go from this rebellious kid to the one I'm gonna ask to lead this church. And so in those 20 years, as you can imagine, God, he radically changed my life. But in those 20 years, though, we went through some really tough seasons as a church. And I stepped in as lead pastor in one of those seasons. And, you know, the church had been like so, it made God use it to change my life so much that all I wanted to do when I stepped in was just help the church get on the other side of the hurt and the other side of the pain because God had used it to change my life. And, and at that point, I didn't know what I was doing. I was this 30-year-old kid. I hadn't gone to Bible school. I went to business school. I wasn't a preacher. I had failed speech three times in college because I, I was terrified to speak in front of people, right? Again, like that God's sense of humor. And so I didn't know what to do except for work. That's what I knew to do was to work, and that's what I did. And so I worked, and 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 I worked. And then after I did all that work, I worked some more. And then after I did that work, I worked some more and some more and some more and some more and some more. You get the picture? Basically, in about 12 months, I worked myself into the darkest season I had ever experienced in my life, very similar to Elijah. And I'm telling you, it was bad, man. Like on the outside, everything was good. The church is stabilized. The church was growing. And so everybody thought everything was, was cool. What people didn't know is that I was dying inside. Like I was completely exhausted all the time, which was so crazy because even as exhausted as I was, there were days upon days upon days when I could not sleep, which meant the mornings were like a horror story right? Because physically, I couldn't get out of bed. As much as I wanted to try to will myself out of it, I could not physically get out of bed. And when I did get out of bed, I pretty much lived off of sugar-free Red Bull and Diet Code Red Mountain Dew, which some of you are like, I can't believe that dude's still alive, <laughs> right? It's like basically drinking poison every day. But that's, that was my only option. That was the only way I could get through the day, I was constantly filled, not just filled, like overwhelming anxiety and hopelessness and despair. I started having like debilitating uh, anxiety attacks and panic attacks. And if you've ever had one, I mean, the ones that like take your breath away. Like the, the, the times when I was able to sleep, I would wake up that next morning and it was like I couldn't catch my breath my heart was pounding out of my chest like I had just ran a sprint because this anxiety. How do you have a panic attack while you're sleeping? That's what I had. 
Elijah was suicidal, and I never got all the way there, but I can remember the moment when it clicked for me, and I was like, I now get it. I was laying in my bed, <clears throat> looking up at the popcorn ceiling, and I can remember thinking to myself, I get how somebody can do that now. Like if they stayed where I'm at long enough, I could get how somebody would, would want to end it all. It was bad. And it wasn't just physically and emotionally and mentally. It was, it was, I was spiritually a mess as well. Again, remember, I'm the lead pastor of this church, and I can remember the Saturday night before I'm supposed to preach three services to thousands of people, I'm having a conversation with my wife in the living room telling her, I don't even know if I'm saved. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, have you ever read John 15? John 15 says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you, and you will produce much fruit. I said, look at the fruit that's being produced in my life. It's no representation of Jesus. It was bad. Anybody know what that's like? I know you do. I have a feeling that there are some of you that are there right now. Like it took everything in you this morning just to get here. There may be some of you this morning who were thinking, I'm going to give the Lord one more shot because I can't do this anymore. I just want you to know if that's you, I don't think you're here by accident. And I don't think I'm here by accident. I believe that before the Lord laid the foundations of the earth, he ordained this moment for us to be together. Amen. Because in these verses to come, we don't just see God's, I mean, Elijah's condition. We get to see God's care for him as well. We get to see God's care for him as well. It says this in verse, in verse 5. Then he lay down under the bush, Elijah and he fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back to him a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank again. So Elijah, he's hit rock bottom. He's in this really dark place, and what does God do? He gets real practical, doesn't he? And he first, he takes care of Elijah's physical needs. I mean, again, at this point, Elijah has pretty much run himself into the ground, which none of us can relate to, right? None of us can relate to living our lives, taking care of everything and everyone else, and neglecting ourselves. No one knows what that's like. None of us know what it's like to be going so fast and so hard in so many different directions that we kind of run ourselves into a bad place. None of us know what that's like. None of us have ever said something silly like, yeah, I'm tired, but I'll sleep when I'm... No one has ever said it. That's not... Elijah, he had run himself into the ground, and so many of us are willingly doing the same thing. It's like we're living our lives like a watermelon. We just keep putting rubber bands around. Have you ever seen that? You take a watermelon and you just keep putting rubber bands around it until it explodes. And what's so crazy about the whole watermelon thing is that like, it's fine until it's not fine because it's, it's all held together until that one rubber band that pushes it over the edge. And it doesn't just crack. That joker explodes. And that's how many of us are living our lives. We're putting more and more pressure and more and more tension and more and more commitments on it. And eventually, we're just setting ourselves up to crack, to crash, to burn, and to explode. Here's the deal. The physical is directly connected to the emotional. It's directly connected to the mental. And so when we are constantly putting ourselves under stress, and we're neglecting our bodies and our well-beings, we are teeing ourselves up for breakdowns and deep seasons of depression. When Elijah was at his worst, God got real practical, and I believe that we need to do the same. 
I, I lead a ministry uh, where we care for leaders. And so we have pastors that come to our retreats and, and we spend almost one entire day challenging the leaders to think about the rhythms that they need in their lives that renew, refresh, and replenish their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. Things that they need to do on a consistent basis that not just leads them into Sabbath rest, but to, into Sabbath living. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're remaining in the Lord, and he's remaining in you, and he's making you new day by day by day. Rhythms. Rhythms like exercise and sleep and adventure and journaling and quiet time and, and whatever it is. I mean, some people, we had one guy, he's like, I need to be on my tractor, and I need to move this pile of wood over here, this pile of wood, and... He was from Savannah. And, uh, um, but another, I mean, another, another person, she was like, uh, I need to organize and I need to dust. And I was like, God bless you. You know what I mean? I don't know what those things are for you, but I, we all need those things. We all need those rhythms. So right now, if you're struggling, what are those rhythms that you need? What do you practically need to do right now to get yourself in a better place. When Elijah was a mess, God started with the practical, but he didn't stop there. Look what happens next. He says in verse 10, and the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. So God, he first addresses the physical, but then what does he do next? He calls Elijah into his presence and whispers. And what does he whisper? He whispers truth. All throughout this passage, Elijah kept saying the same thing over and over. He kept saying, I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm the only one, I'm the only one for you, Lord. And God says, I know you may feel that way, but that's not the truth, Elijah. Verse 18, he says, yet I reserve 7,000 just like you in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. When Elijah was struggling, God reminded him of truth, which totally makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you think about it. When we are weak, we're vulnerable to attacks, and we have an enemy who knows that. And the way the enemy attacks is that he doesn't show up on our front door with a safety vest, knocking on the door and saying, hey, I'm here to ruin your life. Follow me. I'm here to kill, steal, and destroy. Just follow me. No, that's not how you do it. He's a coward and a liar. And what he does is he comes in the side, doesn't he? He masquerades as an angel of light. He's a father. He's the father of all lies. So he comes at us, and he will whisper whatever he can to keep us in the darkness. Whatever he can to keep us isolated and hopeless. And he knows exactly the lies to tell us at exactly the right time. Elijah's like Elijah, like you're alone. Like really, like you are by yourself. No one can understand what you're going on, what's going on with you. And you know what? You just need to keep this to yourself. You need to shut your mouth because you don't want that person to think that of you. They're going to think that you're crazy. They're not going to want anything to do with you. You need to shut your mouth. You don't need to say anything. You don't need to get any help. Or he comes in, he's like, you're such a loser. Like, why can't you get your life together? Why are you so weak? I thought you were such a, a spiritual person. Where's the spirit of the Lord in you now? There's no hope for you. What you're dealing with right now, you're never getting out of this. So you might as well just stay where you're at. He comes with those lies, and he will do whatever he can because he knows if he can keep us in the darkness, he wins. God called Elijah into his presence and he spoke truth and reminded tr him of truth. And I think we need to do the same, especially when we find ourselves in seasons like this. Truths like Psalm 34, 18 says this, the Lord is what? Close to the brokenhearted. 
And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I know that if you're in that, sp- that place today, it's hard to feel this. But that doesn't mean it's not true. The truth is this. You are not alone. And you don't have to fight this battle alone. God hasn't abandoned you, and, and neither have we. Like, we are there for you. And I know what it's like to be in your spot. And I know how scary it is to raise your hand and say, it's me. Like, I, I need to, t- I, I need, I'm not, I'm not good. I need, I need help. I know that that's scary. But I'm telling you, if in your, you're in that spot, don't listen to the lies. Follow the truth. Because freedom is not found in the darkness. It is found in the light where Jesus is. So if you're there this morning, don't, you don't have to stay there if you don't want to. Raise your hand, let some people know, let us know, and let us come alongside you and help you. After I crashed and burned, and I didn't get into all the details of it, but it's, it's bad. I mean, it took me 18 months before I recovered from it, and then as soon as I recovered from it, my wife fell apart because she'd been holding it together for the two of us. She went through 18 months. So for us, it was a 36-month, three-year journey. But in that time period, God, he assembled a team of people that I believe saved my life, a team of doctors and counselors and family and friends and mentors who came alongside me and did for me what I couldn't do for myself. They carried me through that season. And it was painful because they're like, you can't manage your care anymore which means you got to trust us 100% and you have to do whatever we tell you to do. And I was like, what? But I was so tired. I was like, well, I have no choice. God used those people to make me whole and to help me get whole again. And the same can be true for you, but we can't come alongside you until you raise your hand. So if you're struggling this morning, you need to know that freedom is found not in the darkness, It is found in the light. The truth is, you're not alone. God is with you, but that's not all. God's not just with you. He's at work with you right now in your struggles, right now in your circumstances, right now in this season, right now. Romans 8, 28 tells us, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And again, I know that it's hard for you to feel that right now. But that doesn't mean it's not true. The truth is this. He's with you right now in that darkness, right there in those moments, in that season, working for your good and his glory, taking what Satan intends for evil and making it and using it for good. Over the years, my perspective on my depression has radically changed. When I first got diagnosed with it, Like, I was so embarrassed. I'll just tell you, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I didn't want anybody to know. But over the years, that has radically shifted to the point where I don't think of it as a liability anymore. And I don't think of it as a weakness anymore. I I consider it a gift. I'm not saying that because that's what preachers say at the end of messages when they put their cute little bow on it. I'm telling you that because it's true. Because this is what I've learned in the last 15, 20 years, whatever, is that God has used that to keep me close to him. He has used that to keep me dependent upon him. And for that truth alone, I consider it a gift. God is with you. And he is at work right now. But there's more than that. He's not just at work right now. He is at work in the days ahead for you and for me. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he gathered disciples together in John 14, and he he gave them this truth and this hope, and he gave the same to us. He says this in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. What is he saying? He's saying, yes, I'm going away, but hang on, I'm coming back. But in between me leaving and me coming back, I'm going to be at work for you, preparing a place for you. When I come back, I'm taking you to. And just in case you hadn't caught the word on the street, this place 
is like no other place. It is a place where there is no more tears, no more hurt, no more death, no more struggle, no more pain, no more depression, no more taxes, and praise the Lord, no more elections. Can I get a hallelujah? And again, I understand that that truth doesn't change your circumstances right now. And I understand that it doesn't take away the pain right now. But this is what it does do. It gives you and me hope to process the pain through. And it gives us a promise from the Lord to us to process that pain through. And here's the promise. The best is yet to come. No matter what you're dealing with right now, the best is yet to come. Jesus is coming back for you. He's coming back for me. And he's taking us to a place. And because of that, we can hang on. There's hope for us. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. Whenever we're struggling, we have to be reminded of truth. And we need to have people around us remind us of truth. But most of all, what we have to do, we must do, we must cling to the holder of truth, which is Jesus. When we're struggling, it feels natural to run away from the Lord. But that is not the answer. When we're struggling, the answer is not to run away from him. It's to run into him. Jesus is the one that makes these truths true and real and available. And I believe that he is here with us right now. I don't think you're here by accident. I don't think I'm here by accident. I don't think he has us talking about this by accident today. I think he drew us here. And I think he's calling us to something today. All of us. I don't know what it is for you, but I think he's calling you. It may be for you for the first time to raise your hand and say, it's me. I'm hurting. I'm a mess and I need help. For others of you, it may be you need to pull the car off the road today and spend some time with the Lord and get real practical and say, man, I, I'm so off and I'm so depleted and I'm so exhausted. Is it possibly because I'm not sleeping and I'm not eating and I'm not, is it possible? And get practical. Maybe that's what it is. I know this for sure, that if Jesus is here and he's calling us, then there's a, a next step for all of us towards Jesus. And it could be your first step to him where you've never surrendered your life to him, you've never experienced the life and the hope that he has for you, today's the day. For others of you, it may be a step back to him. You've wandered, you've strayed, and maybe it's a step back. For, for others of you, maybe it's a deeper step into Jesus. I'm not sure what the step is, but I can promise you this. Whatever it is, if you take it, you will not regret it. A step towards Jesus is always a step towards hope and love and life. He's here, and he's waiting for you. If you need to take that step, let's take it today. Let's not take it tomorrow. Let's take it right now in these moments. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for, um, for this time. I thank you for my friends who are here today. And we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for the hope that we have in you. And, and I don't know what's going on in the room this morning. I don't know what people are struggling with. And I don't know what next step that you might be calling them to. But, but man, I pray for them this morning, for those who are hurting, who are at that place where they're, they're so hopeless and they're so desperate and they're so exhausted that they are, they're considering ending it all. I just pray in these moments right now, you would whisper to them. Whisper to them, reminding them that there is hope, that there is love, and that you are there with them. I pray for those, all of us, who there's some kind of step I think you're calling us all to. And I don't know what it is, but I just pray that you would make it clear and that you would give us all the faith we need to step out of the darkness and come into the light where you are. We thank you. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.